for the first uh, eight months or so of the COVID pandemic, you know, it, I just thought, and I, I'm assuming this is pr pretty common, you know, we were just waiting it out. Oh, I can deal with Zoom. It will pass a couple of weeks, couple of months. But now, because it still seems like some distance before we'll be in space together. And I have a feeling that these Zoom encounters are not going to go away even when COVID is over. Um, it's like we have to somehow, you know, way back when we were huddled in a small room around a fire, you know, some huge extended family telling stories to each other and through technology and passing of time. Now we're in this strange virtual space where we can't touch and uh, we have a little square rectangle. And I noticed slowly people like the photographs that they have, they're sort of, we're finding ways to, to convey a little bit of information. Some people have some energy to create a kind of background that uh, just the way to be a human being with a personality and but in any case, this is the space we have. So let's really show up for it. And you know how it is in these Zoom encounters. It's easy, <clears throat> just like when we're watching TV or doing other things, it's easy to take a passive, um, have a pa passive relationship to what's going on. But that's actually a choice. So we've got this hour and a half together. And uh, it's just really nice to not have the experience limited by the fact that we're using the Zoom technology. You just make it as real as it can be. That we're a bunch of sentient beings who have a sensitive heart and a fragile body, aging body, and who are interested in learning how to be wise and loving with our predicament as human beings. And I, for one, am very grateful to be here. Doesn't feel like work. It feels like work earlier in the day. Oh, we have the loving kindness program tonight. But now that I'm here, it doesn't feel like work. I feel really grateful to be here. And I thought I'd start tonight um, with a quote from <clears throat> one of my favorite passages, interaction from the time of the Buddha. I forget who the character is who's talking to the Buddha, but the person says to the Buddha, a tangle within, a tangle without. People are entangled in a tangle. Gotama. So Gotama is uh, the Buddha's family name. And so Gotama, I ask you this, who can untangle the tangle. And this was the Buddhist response. A person established in virtue, established in this value of non-harming, developing discernment and mindfulness, ardent and clear, they can untangle this tangle. Those whose passion, aversion, and ignorance have faded away, greed, anger, and delusion, have faded away. For them, the tangle is untangled. And uh, I've been reflecting a lot, just, you know, internally tangled within, externally tangled without, right? And of course, sometimes they're indistinguishable. We listen to the news or we look at what's going on in our families or a group of friends and the spinning, the you know, circulation of greed, anger, and delusion externally somehow seems to be reflected internally within the dialogue and activity of our own hearts and minds and bodies. So this is the spinning. This is the very ordinary spinning. And for sure, you know, sometimes that spinning is a little bit more settled and sometimes it's a little bit more intense and wild. 
but spinning, 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 moment by moment, day by day, week by week, we are quite literally being spun about by these habits, these very deep, deeply rooted tendencies to be relating to our experience with greed, wanting things to be different than they are, with aversion, wanting stuff to change, wanting this to go away, wanting this to not be the way it is, and delusion, which is somehow imagining that being disconnected is the way forward, is skillful, you know, or pretending something is one way when it's not. And clearly, right, we see this externally for sure. We see the world this week, especially spinning with greed, anger, and delusion. And it's really important to maintain the humility that it's the external world in a very real literal sense is also spinning inside of us. Not exactly the same, but the same basic dynamic of the heart being provoked, tormented, excited by greed, anger, and delusion. And our response to the arising of greed or aversion or delusion, our response is the trigger for more of it, right? So that's the feedback loop. When we're aversive and we begin to notice it, it seems to make a lot of sense to be aversive to the aversion, to the tension of the aversion, or to be greedy for a pleasant experience to help modify the yuckiness of the aversion. Or when we feel helpless, it seems to make sense to be deluded, distracted in denial, you know, get absorbed in a book or a movie, pretend it will go away on its own, something like that. That's delusion. So I thought tonight for the, our loving kindness practice group that we do now every Friday, one of the advantages of Zoom, we used to do it only once a month. Now we uh, can manage doing it every Friday. I thought it would be nice to emphasize in particular the teachings and practice of equanimity. It's such a powerful practice. And uh, the first thing we have to open our mind, open our heart to is that equanimity is an enlivened and radiant, loving attitude or quality, or probably best way to think of it is a way of relating, a way of relating that's quite enlivened, like it's not a dull, a flat, or a distant emotion. It's a, it's a real enlivened emotion. It's a beautiful emotion. And it has this amazing capacity to actually, because we think of equanimity as having some distance. And there is that sense of not being pushed around by experience but that not being pushed around by the ups and downs that we associate with equanimity, that's not because we're distant, it's because we know how to be right in the middle without being spun about. So in a way, equanimity really has that quality of the, the marriage of love and wisdom, which is why it's such a potent um, attitude of mind and something we really, in a sense, want to fall in love with, really want to learn to respect and uh, <clears throat> build the confidence that that way of relating, that way of being is actually the potential is already there. We don't need a different personality or a different life or a different circumstance to build or strengthen that habit, that love of equanimity. And maybe not everyone knows, but uh, so when the Buddha talks about love, he talks about four flavors, right? The flavor of friendliness, that's metta. Compassion, that's karuna in Pali. Appreciative joy, appreciating the good. Other people's happiness, making us happy. That's the third, that's mudita. Often we translate that as appreciative joy or sympathetic joy. And then equanimity is the fourth 
quality of love in a way the foundational um, aspect of love. Because one of the main um, contaminants and, and uh, sort of um, something that masquerades as love is this attachment. You know, we really like something, but we're attached or we're feeding on it in some way. So we really like it. But love is, has a kind of independence. It's this generous quality of the heart, right? Like whether it's the compassionate quality of the heart or the appreciative quality of the heart or just the basic friendly quality of the heart, that friendliness, that tenderness of compassion, the appreciation of mudita, that generosity is for its own sake. It doesn't, it's not like a business deal. It's just a gift because the heart feels generous and it doesn't run out. Like a lot of times we think, okay, I could be this friendly and then I got to stop because I'll run out. I'll get burnt out. But that's not real metta or friendliness when it runs out. The very nature of these four qualities of love is that they're boundless. That's one of the basic ways the Buddha points to these, like as we're trying to uncover them, the potential in our own heart is to sense that expansive and boundless quality. It doesn't run out. The more we sense into it, feel it, the more there is to give away, to radiate out. So that's, that, that will help be helpful when we do the guided meditation in a few minutes with equanimity. To, and it's, it's important now just with this information to, for all of us to reform our ideas of equanimity and really have a sense of a, like this potential of resting or abiding and this very potent, very powerful balance of equanimity. And, and to really sense it as a gift out there. We're not kind of making up magical stuff that somehow the radiance of my equanimity is gonna totally transform all the politicians in Washington, DC, and they're gonna sit around the campfire and sing Kumbaya and everything will be changed, right? But in our own heart, we wanna have the confidence that, that this person, me, I can abide in this emotion, this attitude, this way of relating, this way of experiencing my experience with a very healing, beautiful, radiant, enlivening quality of equanimity. And it does feel like it's a beautiful gift to everybody else. But one of the things the Buddha says, and this really ties into his, the Buddhist teachings on equanimity is that our friends, their happiness, our cat's happiness, our dog's happiness, the people in Washington, DC, our politicians, elected officials, their happiness arises, passes away according to causes and conditions, not my wishes for their happiness. So although our direct subjective experience of abiding in these beautiful qualities of love is that it's very healing, that it's a generous, beautiful, useful gift. Still, we have to understand that people's happiness and unhappiness really arises according to their own practice, their own actions, their own intentions, their own motivations, not my wishes for them. But that doesn't diminish how healing and beautiful productive abiding in equanimity. It's our addition, it's our gift to the world. If we were all abiding with equanimity most of the day, this world would not be the way that it is right now. There would not be the injustice, there would not be the meanness, there would not be the suffering. We just have to realize <clears throat> that there's no magic that's gonna make the tangle other than what it is. 
but we can deal with it. We can sort of model what we all, all of us human beings need to do in terms of untangling the tangle. Okay, so that's probably enough. Let's uh, check in with our bodies, get comfortable, and we'll do about 35 minutes of practice and I'll give some guidance. And most of you know, if you've been coming to these Friday night programs where we do the Buddha's teachings and practices of loving kindness, these four qualities of love, you know that it's a creative endeavor. So I'm gonna give some instructions, but it's really okay for you to experiment a little and, and be creative. And I'm gonna post right now in the chat uh, one uh, translation of how the Buddha taught. So you might wanna just get that in front of you because we'll use it in the guided meditation. And then if you need the support, like if you feel your mind's a little wild tonight, distracted, then it, it's actually quite fine, like in the middle of the guided sit when there's some silence, for you to just look at this uh, rough translation of what the Buddha said, and then just read part of it, connect with the meaning, let it have its impact on the heart, and then read a little bit more of the phrase, and then let it have its impact. And then try to keep the reflection going for a while, but when you need to bring up the phrase again or aspects of the phrase, parts of the phrase, the sentences here. And one of the things we need to learn in terms of our, you know, the, the breadth of our spiritual practice is what we call contemplation or reflection, where we're keeping a theme in mind. You know, it's one thing to keep the breathing in, breathing out in mind, but now we're starting with this idea and then eventually more than the idea, the actual attitude of equanimity, we're keeping it in mind. So the main effort in the guided meditation is to remain interested in the attitude of equanimity, to keep that attitude of equanimity in mind and using the words, can be a real crutch, a real useful support for keeping the actual way of relating that we call equanimity in mind. So settle in, you might wanna take a few longer, deeper breaths, just as a way of taking care of your body and supporting a little bit more settling. all the time in the world to breathe in, all the time in the world to breathe out. and allowing the breath to continue on its own. And feeling grateful that we can trust the body to breathe. The body knows how to breathe without the mind having to manage the breathing. So we just feel into the body as a living system feeling the body on this energetic vibrational level, which will include the feeling of the breath moving in the body. And this simple, friendly, tender-hearted connection, awareness of the body the sitting body, this breathing body. And we realize the simple truth, I'm not making it up. I care about this body. I 
I care enough to be close, to be right in the middle of the experience of sensation here, undefended, open, because I care. Because I care, I want to be right in the middle. I want to be feeling what's here to be felt in the body, this flow or movement of sensation. I wish to be unafraid to feel what's here to feel now with real interest. And the equanimity is the understanding that although I care about the body, although I wish to be here in a friendly way, aware in a friendly way, I understand that how the body is, the particular sensations, comfort or discomfort, that I'm not really in control that how it is, is really a matter of so many causes and conditions. But still I care, even though I can't stop the aging process or can't stop the onset of illness or death, of course. But notice how it doesn't stop the heart from caring and wishing well for the body. This helps the heart understand the power of equanimity. This body is the way that it is. An expression of so many causes and conditions and still I care deeply. Care enough to be right here in the middle. And sense, if you can, that quality of equanimity, a beautiful balance, radiant balance, touching, affecting the whole body. I care about this body and the conditions that in this body are just the way they are now. And the phrase that I put in the chat, we can just adjust it so it works for the body. I will abide, pervading all quarters of this body with a heart imbued with equanimity, above, below, all around, everywhere, in every way. I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing body with a heart imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, free from hostility and ill will. This is a beautiful gift, happy to offer this to the body, this equanimous presence And you might even sense how the body responds by relaxing perhaps a little bit more, settling.
And remember, you can come back to the phrase. Remember to be creative if you need, adapt, adjust, so that the words make sense or powerful for you. I will abide pervading this body with the love of equanimity, this beautiful balance above and below, all around, everywhere, every way. I will abide pervading this body with the love of equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, free from any negativity, from any fear, I will abide. So I have some silence and just, if you like, continue working with the body, relating to the body with the love of equanimity. And there's something beautiful and healing whenever the mind, the heart is relating with equanimity, in this case, relating to the body with equanimity. It's a beautiful healing and even pleasant, sometimes very pleasant quality or way of being. until we feel that every part of the body is touched by this beautiful and healing radiant balance of equanimity. And if you want, when you want, just move on to the heart and mind itself. Just follow the same pattern. I care about my sensitive heart, this thinking mind, this knowing mind. I care about this heart, I care enough to be close and to sense and feel and know the mind as it is right now. And to relate with equanimity, I will abide pervading this mind and heart, this good heart with equanimity all quarters, above and below, 
everywhere and every way. I will abide pervading this heart with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, free from hostility and ill will. So again, be creative and just sense and open to the heart, the mind right here, relating with equanimity, this radiant balance Remember, equanimity doesn't need things to be different than they are. Remembering that the heart, the way the mind is now, we can't really make it the way we want it. We can care about the heart, but it's really an expression of so many causes and conditions. So instead of trying to make the heart or fix it, we realize we can relate to the way the mind is. We can relate to the heart with equanimity. It's very beautiful and healing and radiant way of being, way of relating. And as you're ready, just continue moving out. You might bring to mind somebody easy to bring to mind. It could be a pet or a dear one, a friend. And you realize that their happiness or unhappiness depends on so many causes and conditions, not your wishes for them. But still, you care, you love, you wish well. And you can meet them with this beautiful, stable balance of equanimity. I will abide pervading this dear one, this person, this pet, with this equanimity. All aspects above and below, everywhere and every way. I will abide relating to you with equanimity, abundant, exalted, unshakable, free from hostility and ill will. I will abide. So just widening the circle if you're ready, if you want to include friends, family, whoever comes to mind. It's beautiful, stable, unshakable smile of love, radiant love of equanimity.
And as I've been saying, whoever we're bringing to mind, we remember that their happiness or unhappiness depends on so many causes and conditions, including their actions, not so much my wishes for them, but still I care. And I generously offer this friendliness, this tenderness, this appreciation, this beautiful equanimity, this powerful balance that understands that things are the way that they are. And I love you and I care for you and I wish well for you. Even though causes and conditions are the way they are right now. So take your time, we'll have some silence now and you can bring to mind whoever comes to mind and even including all beings, even the difficult beings in your life if you want. But you can also come back to something simple like relating to the body and relating to your own heart. So just follow your own intuition as we continue to sit for another 10 or 15 minutes in silence using the phrase that I put in the chat, if it's helpful. making the effort to keep equanimity in mind.
And of course, as we widen the circle and just sense all the people, for example, on the Zoom call tonight, and all our friends, the people we live with, the other beings, pets that we live with, perhaps, all our, our colleagues we might be working with, all the difficult people in my life, neighbors, the entire world, near and far. So many being so much spinning with happiness and unhappiness and justice and injustice. And all this happiness and unhappiness of all these beings, we sense that that happiness and unhappiness arises because of so many causes and conditions. And still I care. I care about all of these beings. I care enough to be sensitive right here, right now. And I care enough to offer this beautiful balance of equanimity and to really abide with this powerful balance with all the love and all the hate all the goodness and all the ill will, kind of unflappable, unshakable presence, willing to see it all and feel it all and do what we can, but not feel crushed, not feel depleted if suffering continues or if there's things that we can't do, can't fix. That's how it is. <coughs> In one of the suttas, it says, your happiness or unhappiness depends on your actions, not my wishes. It's really hard to open our hearts to the truth that we can't take people's suffering away. We might be able to be part of the causes for their happiness, but we're not actually responsible for someone's happiness or unhappiness. Ultimately, that has to be that person's responsibility. That really helps us understand that we can always abide in equanimity as a radiant, compassionate, friendly love. Sensing all the swirls, all the ups and downs, the good fortune and the bad fortune. and not having to run away or not having to close our heart. I will abide pervading the all encompassing world with this heart imbued with equanimity, this radiant, generous balance, intimate balance, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide.
And take a little time, adjust your bodies, comfortable. I think it's really important with the practice of equanimity that we see ourselves as a student and, uh, and have some real humility about finding, you know, the long twisting path of finding our way into equanimity. Because as you know, like in uh, the Buddhist teachings on these qualities of the heart, especially later in the later centuries, as they were systematizing these practices, they came up with this idea of the near enemies. So what masquerades as equanimity, indifference. And so we need to, you know, we know when we're reactive and the world or another person is pushing our buttons, you know, we know that that's not equanimity. But sometimes, you know, when we have a lot of distance Everything's going fine in my life and I'm not reading the papers and I'm, or the reading the news and, oh, I have a lot of balance. <laughs> and then we talk to a friend or we talk to somebody in our family or we read the news and then we don't have any more balance, right? Because we think it's crazy. Like, why, why are they doing that? And so, this is a good time, especially these days, it seems, to really uh, experiment with equanimity, like really seeing the craziness of our own mind, seeing the craziness of the world, the craziness of our families, of our relationships, the intensity, both the good and the bad. But, but realizing there's something that can remain quite stable and balanced even, and that that stability and balance can have a very generous, even radiant, loving quality to it. it. It isn't the same as compassion. It isn't the same as friendliness. It isn't the same as sympathetic joy. It has its own flavor. Uh, some of you know the Buddhist teacher, Venerable Analio. He's a German man, but he's been a Buddhist monk now for quite a while and an amazing Buddhist scholar, besides being a, an amazing meditator and spiritual practitioner. And although he trained for many years in Sri Lanka, he's now <clears throat> living in Massachusetts at the, on the cap, campus of Insight Meditation Society and the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. So I've been able to study with him many times over the last 10 years or so, uh, now that he's in this country. And uh, he has this really powerful image for equani equanimity. He equates loving kindness as like the sun at noon, the kind of obvious radiance of the sun in the middle of the day. And uh, compassion is the sun at sunset, has a lot of poignancy, right? And uh, mudita, appreciative joy, is sunrise, a lot of hope and, oh yeah, this is great. Sun is coming back. And for equanimity, he uses not the sun, but the full moon. It has a cooler quality, still quite bright, pervasive, radiant, but it has a really cool vibe. Oh, there are so many causes and conditions that are affecting the ups and downs of my heart, the ups and downs of my body, the ups and downs of my family, of my relationships, of our world. Oh, can I hold it all? Yeah, we, it's like, it's like the, uh, it's like, you know, feeling pushed around by the waves on the ocean and then learning to relate to the waves on the surface of the ocean from the perspective of the breadth and depth of the ocean. And it's just a lot easier to deal with the waves when you're uh, connected, like we have roots into the totality of the ocean. Then the waves are kind of, they have perspective. 
In Buddhism, we talk about the eight worldly winds, gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and disrepute, success and failure. Right? And so this is a, another list you, know, you can use, whether you're observing another, the dog is happy, the dog is unhappy, you know? My friend is falling in love with a great person or my friend is broken up and they're really sad. You know, my body's really healthy, my body's feeling sick. And uh, what attitude, what way of being or relating can encompass all of that? Isn't shook, isn't depleted by any of that? And can I abide, can I keep that in mind, that way of being, that way of relating as a kind of refuge? And so this aspect of love that we call equanimity, it really is said to have the flavor of awakening. You know, we might wonder, well, what's it like to be a Buddha or an awakened one? Uh, well, no, I guess when we get there, but what those along the way tell us, you know, and the tradition is, well, it has the flavor of equanimity. And you know, the, it's so interesting in the tradition that happiness is really talked about, the deeper happiness is beyond pleasure. Because as long as the mind is oriented around pleasure, it's afraid of pain. So pleasure is nice. And we definitely want to use pleasure, especially inner pleasure, like contentment and ease, calm. These are nice pleasures to get to know. They're very healing. But the deepest happiness is when the mind is no longer dependent on pleasure and no longer afraid of pain. And this is really what equanimity is pointing to, which is why it, it really has this flavor or resonance of awakening with the Buddha, the peace of a Buddha. And it, it's really for us to discover, like we need that confidence that we've already learned a thing or two about it, but you know how it is when we don't have a, a language, a word, like I could, uh, we're here on the New Jersey shore quarantining until we see uh, winds mother, um, we've been here for a week now. And so hopefully soon we just got our test today and no COVID, so that's good. And so hopefully um, we'll be able to visit in a few days. But uh, I've been walking, there's a state park nearby right on the coast. So it's really beautiful sand dunes and, and uh, coastal plums, I think they're called these sort of really low trees in the dunes and grasses and beautiful shoreline and yeah, it's just uh, that kind of, you know, and then the grayness of the winter on the coast. And it's just kind of, uh, and no leaves, you know, on the plants. And it, it has a little bit of that. It's not really beautiful in the kind of summer, you know, we get to splash in the waves or um, there's a lot of life or, oh, it's kind of cool and gray. And we're really learning to cultivate a taste for the heart, not having a problem with anything that's unpleasant and not having a need for anything that's pleasant. And it's really the happiness of non-dependence or the happiness of th not needing things to be different. And this is like, you know, when we think about marriage or having a partner or a good friend and, and it's going to last, we need that equanimity. Because if it's a dependent love, like I love you because you have these qualities. Well, what happens if as we get to know the person, we realize those qualities are just a thin veneer. And underneath that thin veneer, there are other qualities that I don't like so much. Yeah, and then, we're, then the whole relationship is vulnerable. And it's just like really interesting to explore whether it's with your pet, with your body, with your partner, with a friend, with the wider world, this love of equanimity, 
where you're really not needing it to be different. We had to drive like 45 minutes today to get to the clinic where we took our COVID test. And it was an old New Jersey town, kind of a little bit more in, uh, inland from where we are staying. And uh, I don't know, it was just like a lot of strip malls. And, and, and so initially my mind unconsciously, I had an aversive reaction, like there's nothing pretty here. There's nothing quaint, there's nothing, you know. And then uh, we had to wait, you know, in the parking lot to get into the clinic for a while. So I was sort of walking around and, uh, and then I finally noticed that my mind was a bit aversive, not in a big way, but just sort of, it's kind of a cold gray day and I'm in this old town and it looks a little depleted, the town, you know, a little, nothing special and kind of part of America that I don't like and um, shops that I would never go in and things like that. And then, uh, and then it just occurred to me like, but there's a way for my heart to be intimate, to be relaxed and open. Because what makes it beautiful isn't that the town, the sidewalks, the shops, the people, the cars are beautiful. What makes something beautiful worthy of intimacy is the way of relating. And that's why this quality of love is so related to wisdom because we realize that the whole path is about relation or how the mind, how the heart is relating. And nobody can take that away from us because what shows up in our life, the ca causes and conditions, the circumstances, whether people like us or don't like us, or we or have good fortune or bad fortune, that's in a way set in motion with all these causes and conditions. But one thing that's always in play right now is how the mind is gonna be relating to the wildness of causes and conditions, which we don't have much control over. And equanimity is such a powerful um, thing to uncover, to discover, and to build confidence in. So I wanted to kind of lay a little of that out. Maybe I'll read one quote and then open it up for discussion. We have lots of time. And it'd be nice to hear just in everyone's experience, living your life with the eight worldly winds, what you've been learning about equanimity. So this is uh, Christina Feldman wrote a book on these four qualities of love. I think it's, I think it's called The Boundless Heart. It came out several years ago. It's a nice book. Also, Sharon Salzberg has an excellent book on these four divine abodes of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. Hers is called Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. And then this is Christina Feldman, one of our um, elders in our insight meditation tradition, mostly teaches in England, but has been coming to IMS to teach once a year at least. And Christina writes in her book, equanimity does not leave kindness, joy, or compassion behind but is imbued with these qualities, which rescue it from indifference or coldness. Like kindness, joy, and compassion, equanimity is not a state, but describes a relational way of being with life that rests upon a profound understanding. And that profound understanding is what I was just talking about, like the world, of causes and conditions, the world of experience is coming and going due to this complexity of causes and conditions. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of unreliability, right? These endless movement of the eight worldly winds, gain and loss, success and failure, praise and blame. And uh, we can be intimate, we can be balanced, and it can be enlivened with love and tenderness and joy. But the equanimity is as a foundational quality of love. It keeps, it sort of gives some immunity to any attachment, any, the heart getting dependent 
on the suffering going away or dependent on the pleasantness staying. And that makes us, that really helps in life because if as an activist, I needed the world to change, well, I'd be a pretty fragile activist when things didn't go my way. You know, imagine people who've been fighting for climate change. I saw part of a program on Thursday night, maybe some of you were there, sponsored by Clouds and Water and some other folks, and a lot of common ground people were there about line three, the Enbridge pipeline that they're proposed to be built in Northern Minnesota and affecting some of the uh, land of the indigenous people up there and oh, many other complexities about how much carbon we're gonna be burning over the next decades. And, uh, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's just interesting how to hold this kind of complexity and, uh, and, the, and, and just the resilience and persistence of the people who've been trying to keep this in the public view. Like, do we really want to open up the Alberta tar sands and pull out all the carbon that's in that, that petroleum over the next few decades, which will then, of course, just go into the atmosphere? Is that the right thing to do? And just like, who knows whether they're going to win? And this is just one little pipeline. You know, there are so many other ways that this can happen. And I'm just really impressed with people's ability to stay connected and engaged. And I think it's because they, they if they're really going to do that, they need equanimity. Otherwise, they burn out. Anyway, be nice to hear from other folks. And with this size group, I think it's okay for People, just to unmute yourself, just remember that you might be unmuting yourself and starting to speak just when someone else is doing that. So pay attention and, and one of the people just defer to the other. And it's nice to say your first name at least and maybe give us your pronouns if you want so we don't accidentally misgender you. That's always nice. Um, yeah, and anybody can start. What have you been learning about equanimity or what questions or arising for you about the practice we did tonight that you'd like to bring up? I'd like to start. Uh, yeah, so that sounds right. And, uh, you know, when we always have to understand that when these teachings get transmitted to us, and, you know, it's different, different teachers do it in different ways, but whoever is transmitting, it's always going to be in a more formal, presented in a more formal way but living it is not going to line up with, you know, how it's been articulated or written down for us. And that's the important thing is to make it real and to definitely uh, learn to trust our experience. And hopefully, eventually, uh, if we orient around what we're learning from our experience, we'll often, if it's a good tradition, we'll often be able to understand why a good teacher or a good teaching was articulated or written in that way. Oh, that's why they did it that way. That's why they talked about it this way. Now that I get my experience, I have it under my belt, enough of it, I see. And so a lot of this, like I was mentioning with the vocabulary, um, you know, we don't notice equanimity until we have a word. And same with loving kind, you know, so these different flavors of how the heart is intimate and how the heart is stabilized with generosity. Because it's really that generous, expansive quality that really stabilizes the heart. Because when I'm in a more needy, self-centered and needy relationship with my experience, that's an unstable way. There's a somebody who's trying to make the experience the way that somebody wants it to be. And so basically I'm at war with reality because reality is playing out many causes and conditions. And there's a somebody who is dependent on it being a particular way. And that's what I meant earlier too about it really needs to be creative. It doesn't mean we stop listening to how people are sharing the practice or whatever, but we have to make it our own. And the equanimity is often described as the foundation. There's really no friendliness 
without equanimity underneath it. Other thoughts people have. We all feeling something similar with the exposure and, uh, and it really begs the question of what is our refuge? And you know, the, the basic conditioning we've gotten is we think our refuge is making the world a better place. Now, this may sound a little strange, but that's not a refuge. In a way, that's a privilege to generously give ourselves to making the world a better place, whether we're dealing with that on a very local, in a very local sense and creating a nice garden that we share with the neighbors or raising a family or getting engaged in a local sense to make the neighborhood a better place or working on a global issue. But it's, but the, what makes, the, that's kind of a privilege to, to sort of give ourselves to the world. What really saves us is this uh, understanding that the world is the way that it is. And even if we straighten something out, something next to it could be falling apart. You know, so even if one thing gets fixed, another breaks. I'm in my 60s now. I'm starting to realize this about my body, you know, old injuries, you know, and I patiently get my knee back working. I used to run a lot when I was young. And uh, in back in those days, you know, before running got popular, no one thought about teaching people to stretch. <laughs> we just ran. And uh, so now I've got some problems with my body, you know, related to all that running and stuff. But, you know, you, you get one thing going and then, oh, yeah, that wrist from that bike accident. And now it's coming back. And then there's this thing in the shoulder and, and we think, oh, I got to get, I got to get it together. But the more we reflect with wisdom, we realize the world isn't about getting it together. It's never utopia. It's not in the cards. Perfection is not in the cards. And when we really let that sink in with our families, with our partners, with our pets, with the world, then our engagement has no expectation of leading to perfection. So then we really get my engagement is a gift. It, it itself is an end, like that I care enough to engage, whether I'm just slowing down, like, you know, in terms of global warm, warming, the climate activists, they might slightly slow down the world getting warmer but it's just putting off the crisis, let's say. So should they not engage? Well, maybe their engagement itself is a beautiful healing thing, even if it doesn't solve the problem of global warming. Fighting for racial justice may be a beautiful thing, even if there are other counter forces in society like white supremacy that have its own momentum that are build that's building. Right? So we're just sort of not really turning things around. Does that mean we should engage? And that's just such an interesting, because it isn't the same as helplessness. It's really understanding that we can engage in a beautiful way, even if all hell is breaking loose. And nobody can take that away from us. I think I said that earlier. Like to really see that as a refuge, to be relating with love and wisdom, that's my refuge. Not, I'm going to relate with love and wisdom in order to make the world perfect or my family heal my family. They may heal or they may not because there are so many other causes and conditions at play, not just how I'm showing up in this moment. That's like a corollary to that whole ocean metaphor that I used earlier. Like if we really understood all the forces at play, if we could really feel all the forces at play, then of course we'd understand why what happened at the Capitol happened at the Capitol, not forgiving or not condoning, but just understanding, oh yeah, yeah. These, these forces, this has been building, this is, 
not so much how it had to be or meant to be, but just it was the lawful expression of what's moving. And then the question is, how do I relate to all of that? What's the skillful way to relate? Well, one thing is not to be surprised. Why, why was that surprising? What was I not aware of? Thanks, Becca. I'd like to go next. Other reflections or questions people might have? Uh, taking a hike and seeing a poisonous snake, you know, you might initially relate with fear, but if, if you were very familiar with them, really studied them, learned their habits, so you knew how to stay safe with the poisonous snake, you, you might have a lot of affection and love, but you would never touch the snake, you know, but, but you wouldn't have any fear or aversion because you knew how to keep yourself safe with the snake. And uh, so that kind of practical question about who I should spend time with and who I should stay distant from, you know, it may be very natural, but it doesn't necessarily affect this kind of love, this spiritual kind of love, as opposed to uh, a kind of love that do you want to be my partner or do you want to move in? You know, that's a different, that's not, that's not the kind of love we're talking about. It's the absence of fear and aversion. But that doesn't mean we're going to spend time with the person just because we don't have any fear or aversion. The question of who we spend time with is a really can be a very natural thing. You just see, oh, you know, I've got this impulse to pick up my phone and call this person. Oh, I don't have an impulse to pick up my phone and call this other person. You know, it's already that attraction where, you know, it's almost like uh, an, am an amoeba, those simple single cell creatures that we look at when we're in a high school biology class. They know to go where there's sugar and away from where there's salt that is toxic for the little creature. And in a way, in terms of relationships, we'll find our way in terms of attraction or, or where there's fun, where it's awkward or whatever. But as a practitioner, we want to be aware of ill will. So when we have that big, wide and deep picture of equanimity, when we have wisdom, we realize I don't need to be afraid and I don't need to hate you. but that doesn't tell me whether I should call you or not. That's a more practical, natural thing. Like, is there an impulse to do that? Is there any reason to mistrust that impulse? So we check, like, is it just aversion? No, I'm not averse. I don't hate that person. I just don't want to be with them. It doesn't seem helpful for anybody to be with them. And like sometimes though we have an obligation, like that person needs help. And it seems like I'm the right person to help that person. And, but even then it's sort of like uh, all that information is there. I mean, this is the thing where we're just part of nature. So what makes it, things really start to work is helping nature, i.e. this nature, you know, the way my mind is conditioned and the way I'm sensitive to make it more and more inclusive. It's like our implicit biases that we all have because of our cultural conditioning around race, around gender, around so many of these spectrums of difference, right? But if I train my mind to be more sensitive to all that cultural conditioning, it's just so much easier for me to navigate my world. 
I can't make things different. You know, I can't get in there and easily uproot all my conditioning around race or around gender, around class, but I can be aware of it. And then that affects who I call and who I don't call and what I say and when I, what I don't say and when I talk and when I stay quiet. Does, does any of that make sense? Thanks, Abby. Anything else you wanted to say? I think we have time for maybe one more comment or reflection if anybody would like to share some thoughts. It, it really helps to practice, which is what we're doing tonight and, and to kind of get interested in it because what really helps these qualities, these ways of relating, what helps them to grow and become more, more part and a more dominant part of the personality is by keeping them in mind, keeping equanimity in mind, actually just being interested in equanimity. And we've already been conditioned to be interested in anger and greed because it's so juicy and it's so promoting of that strong sense of self, the egoic sense of self. So we don't have a counter to that, which is why there's this whole spiritual practice, you know, that um, because it helps us get interested in other ways of being, other ways of relating. And, uh, and then having friends that we talk to can also, because we can, like, it'd be so helpful to recognize in each other, boy, you know, when we were hanging out, Deborah, you were just so equanimous when you handled that situation and kind of mirroring that back for each other. That would be so helpful. You know, I would have freaked out, but you just seemed pretty balanced. You know, I was really impressed. So, you know, just experiment and of course, start like remembering equanimity, not just in the intense places of life, but we will build more confidence when we're in a more ordinary, safer, more simple circumstance and really highlight the balance. Like, oh, right now, this mind doesn't need things to be different than they are. Let me notice and, and really like, how that not needing things to be different really allows me to be close to what's going on, intimate and exposed in a way. And then we'll notice that feels good, feels real. And to, to especially notice the radiant or the expansive quality of these different four qualities of love, because that, that boundlessness has a very distinct flavor that the heart naturally trusts, as opposed to more of a narrowing, like when we're self-centered, that's when we look at that, it's always mis not trustworthy because it's contracted. But the expanded states are trustworthy because they have that inclusive, generous, the, yeah, just the, the intuition is, oh yeah, this feels right. Mm -hmm. Really nice to be with everybody tonight. I noticed, I don't see him on this first page, but I think Rob, oh, there he is, is here tonight. And Rob is our team, snow team leader, has been for a couple of years now. And uh, uh, we're always looking for people to join and then they take turns. We've got a really nice Toro snow blower. So those of you who are local, not the ones from LA or else, elsewhere, <laughs> But those of you who live in the Minneapolis area and want to help when we have big snowstorms, uh, just contact the center. We'll connect you with Rob and get you on the email list. And, the, and Rob has a way of organizing folks so that it doesn't land on just one person's shoulders too often. Um, and the more folks, the easier it is to get through the winter. And lots of things are starting in the new year. There's a new Buddhist studies class. Everyone's welcome to join on Monday night. We're going to be studying for eight weeks, mindfulness of the body, the Buddhist teachings on embodiment that starts on Monday night. 
And uh, there's an intro class beginning on Tuesday nights for six weeks. I know Jean Haley is also doing something on mindfulness and money on Tuesday evening in the Dhamma Among Us program. And there's a half day retreat tomorrow afternoon. There's still space in and, and many other things. So just uh, look at the online calendar if you interested. And the next uh, two-day retreat will be over President's Weekend, all day Friday and Saturday of that weekend in the middle of February. So keep that in mind as well. Thanks so much, everyone. Wishing you all well, lots of safety, and hope to run into you again soon. <laughs>